There's a breaking ball in for a strike, and he stood there like the house by the side of the road and watched it go by. Struck him off. Set the pitch. He swings. Bounding ball. Stopped by Truby for the second one. Really the first two for the price of one for the Tigers. A great play by Truby to end the... John Russell, Rick Hickman with you this Wednesday evening once again. And, of course, we are very honored by a special guest today. And who better to bring the game of baseball to life than Ernie Harwell? And we're proud to welcome him to the Power Hour tonight. Well, thank you. It's good to be with you. Well, Ernie, we hear that that voice, and uh, boy, that's been the your voice has been the soundtrack for so many summers. I know in Rick and Ira's lives, and we just speak from from our standpoint. But uh, what from like 1960 in the in the in the Michigan era to just uh, really just a few years ago, when when you hear the the tones of Ernie Harwell, you think summer and you think Tiger baseball. Well, we had a great time in uh, Michigan, and uh, that was the my final stop on my baseball broadcasting career, and the. People of Michigan have been great, warm, and friendly, and receptive, and I can never thank them enough. You've been working on a very special project of late called the Audio Scrapbook. Feel free to give our audience an idea of what's behind that project. We had a lot of fun with that. A fellow named Gordon Miller had the idea that he could make a scrapbook of audio and put put it on some disc and sell it, and he got the voice of Duke basketball and football named Bob Harris, come up to a studio in Detroit. We sat down in the studio and just uh, gabbed back and forth. Uh, He had some questions and I had some answers. We didn't have any script at all. Bob had some questions written out, but everything for me was off the cuff. And the editors uh, finally got all that uh, blabbering and uh, sorted it out and put it together into the Ernie Harwell audio scrapbook. And I think the best thing about it is that the editors, uh, uh, in the the assortment that they made, uh, they made it easy for the listener because if he didn't like a segment I was talking about, he could push a button and go to the next one. And uh, that also uh, more or less indexed it or gave you a table of contents. But it was a lot of fun for me to do, and I enjoyed it. The CD covers four hours of material, so the listener certainly gets a great value for that, and it can be ordered at eharwell.com, and we'll be talking about that uh, throughout the hour here and in the weeks to come here on the Power Hour. But you obviously allowed enough time to really get a lot of great baseball information packed into that. Well, it was uh, sort of interesting to me that uh, we had a we had an interview that I did in 1940 with Connie Mack. Connie Mack at that time was probably 80 years old, and uh, he was born in the middle of the Civil War in 19 in 1862. And uh, what happened was, and I, I understand this now as I get older, uh, Connie Mack uh, was talking about the 1905 World Series with Christian Matheson and Chief Bender and uh, Rube Waddell and all those people. And uh, he had a great uh, recollection of that. And then I asked him about the outstanding rookie of the 1940 season, and he couldn't remember the guy's name. (laughs) It was Bob Kennedy, and I've run into the same kind of a syndrome now as I get older. Uh, Ernie, uh, one of the great stories I think in, in the uh, in the audio um, collection as well is is um, the the home run that Bobby Thompson hit. The 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 call that I think any baseball fan remembers is uh, was Russ Hodges. The Giants win the pennant. The Giants win the pennant. But it's a little known fact that you were working the radio end of, of that. Is that correct? Well, I was on the TV and oh, TV Russ end. was on yes, the radio. Right, that's my fault. Yeah, we we alternate between those two, and uh, there were five different radio broadcasts and. <laughs> I felt like I had the better assignment because it was the first sports series ever telecast coast to coast. And I was on NBC TV all by myself. But uh, a fellow who was a Brooklyn fan that tuned in on Russ and wanted to hear him cry a little bit because the Giants were behind the Brooklyn Dodgers. And uh, when Bobby Thompson hit the home run, of course, it gave the Giants the victory. And the fan was a good enough sport to send the tape to Russ. He gave it to our sponsor, Chesterfield. They got it out as a record, and it became the most famous sports broadcast of all time. (laughs) Russ Hodges on the radio saying the Giants won the pennant, the Giants won the pennant. I was on TV, and we didn't have any replays. We didn't have any recording at all of the TV at that time. And uh, nobody knows I was on except uh, Miss Harwell and me. (laughs) 
Well, and obviously you've had 66 terrific years with your beloved Lulu, and it's often been said that behind every great man is a great woman. And to have put up with the demands of traveling and all of the loads of demands on your time, what's been the secret and glue to your wonderful marriage? Well, I think it's the fact that she's so adaptable, and uh, when I was away on on uh, the road with the tiger, she had to be both the mom and dad, and we had a facetious saying in those days when you had to telephone on hard lines, you know, you didn't have cell phones, mm-hmm. and a phone call was uh, much more significant. We, we had a saying that, uh, don't ever call home, there might be a crisis, <laughs> and uh, that's usually what happened. One of the kids would bump into a tree, a bust his head open or get hit by a ball or something and she had to take him to the hospital but uh, she was she's been great and uh, we've had a wonderful marriage and it's mainly because of her i'm sure i know that you're also from from georgia originally but obviously you spend your winters up here in in michigan uh, how does a southern boy deal with uh, with the uh, the snow and the the cold weather that we have I just don't go outside unless I have to. <laughs> I like snow on a Christmas card. <laughs> well, we do know that you get outside because you're famous for your right. walking regimen. You've been a spokesman for the Blue Cross, the Blue Care Network folks for quite a while now, and you have a very faithful approach to staying active. Tell us about that. Well, I do have an approach to staying active, and I live in a place now where we have a gymnasium, hmm. and I can go right down uh, a couple of stairs and uh, get to the gym and I work out every day and uh, even before that uh, I I work out in the mornings I jump rope uh, 300 times I do some stretching and uh, then later in the afternoon I go down and one day I'll do a cardio I'll uh, do on the treadmill and an elliptical machine and then every other day I add uh, the weights they have weights they're resistant weights and I do that so I don't miss a time I try Uh, every day to to work out about 30 or 40 minutes and try to keep healthy and watch my diet and do the best I can. Now, very impressive. Certainly a role model for us, John. We need to kind of get on the bandwagon with Ernie. I'm I'm getting winded just uh, hearing him tell that. (laughs) Uh, Ernie, talk about when did you start all of that? I mean, was that something that's that's followed you your whole life, or was there a point in your life where you said, hey, I I really got to get active and really got to take care of myself here? Uh, There was a point when I started. I didn't uh, really do a whole lot uh, uh, until maybe the, the uh, 70s or the 80s. And then I think I started jumping rope around uh, the 75, probably, and uh, just kept at it. And uh, then in, when I lived in Florida, I lived in Dunedin uh, for quite a while, 18 years, and uh, it was a small town, and I had a bicycle then. And uh, I would uh, take a nap usually in the early afternoon. When I got up my nap, I would get on my bike and and ride a real hard for about 20 minutes. And then when the Sparky came to the Tigers, I substituted that when I went on the road. We always got out and walked every day. We'd get up after breakfast and, and walk for about an hour. And the Sparky had to have a sounding board, you know, somebody <laughs> listen to his stories and, and his strategy and things like that. And I think every manager of a big league ball club has to have a little relaxation and have somebody he can talk to and unburden himself and uh, Sparky and I had a great time and I miss those walks but uh, now I do everything indoors I don't get out in the in the cold weather here infield in double play depth for the Mariners they've had a lot of ground balls so far today here's the pitch on the way he swings and fouls it off it'll reach the seats over back of the uh, Tiger dugout. And the man from Walla Walla will take that one home. Well, Ernie, I know you've told this story a million times, but it's one thing we just want to kind of fill in your background a little bit. Talk to us about your start in, in broadcasting uh, and, uh, you know, kind of give us the the the, uh, the Ernie Harwell story in, uh, in synopsis form here. When uh, I was a youngster, I was a great baseball fan. My dad loved baseball, and he sort of inculcated that in me, and I was an avid reader of the sporting news, the baseball paper, national baseball paper then in St. Louis. And uh, I read it every issue it came out, and I was very avid about reading it. And In 1934, when I was in high school, for no particular reason, I sat down and wrote an editor, the editor a letter and saying I should be the Atlanta correspondent for the sporting news, and I signed my name W. Ernest Harwell, <laughs> Not a little bit more mature. Right. He didn't know I was mm-hmm. only uh, 16 years old. So eventually he gave me the job, and I became the Atlanta correspondent. And 
1934, the year that uh, Sparky Anderson and, and Al Kaline were born, 73 years ago. And that got me in the media, and then on the strength of that, I got a job on the Atlantic Constitution, working on the copy desk, reading copy and writing headlines and reporting things when uh, they didn't have anybody else to do it. And I, was, I really had the ambition of being a newspaper man, a sports writer, but uh, there were no jobs open about the time I was graduating from Emory University in Atlanta, and <clears throat> I found out I couldn't get a job on the paper in Atlanta or anywhere else, so... I heard about an audition at WSB, the NBC 50,000-watt station there in Atlanta, and I went down and took the audition to be their sports announcer, and luckily I won it. That got me into radio, and I've been in that ever since. You know, and and I hear those stories, and I hear the the Vin Scully stories where it's almost like oh, I was an eighteen year old and I didn't have anybody doing radio, so I <laughs> I went up there and tried it, and and, uh, and I got the job. Boy, those stories are just so precious because that that just is so far from how it's done nowadays, isn't it? Yeah, it's a lot different now. It's a lot more uh, uh, structured, I think now. And uh, I think one thing good now is you have internships, which uh, we never had in my day. You either got a job or you didn't. Uh huh. And uh, now an intern can come in, and if the people like him, they can hire him. If he likes a job or likes the idea, he he can uh, latch on to it. And it's it's a lot better system uh, than we had. But I think it's a there's so many people breaking in now into radio and TV that it, uh, it's a lot harder proposition probably that, than it was when I came along. Obviously, with all of your decades of experience of broadcasting baseball, you've also lived a lot of American history, and whether it was the 40s, the 60s, the 80s, it seems like each decade brings a, a different set of history with it. Have you felt that people are inherently always the same, or does there really seem to be a change in the ball players of today compared with the decades long ago? No, I think people are pretty much the same. I think uh, human nature doesn't uh, change. If you if you read Shakespeare, you can see a great insight to human nature and the people that he write about in his plays. Uh, uh, their same personalities and characteristics are reflected in the people that live next door to us right now. So I don't think things change that much, and I did have a rather long span. You know, I came along when a lot of people didn't have electricity. Of course, there was no television. Radio was just getting started. It hadn't been commercialized. Mm -hmm. I was in the Depression when uh, people were happy to work for a dollar a day if they could, and and there there was no welfare people. When they were out of a job, they were just out of a job and had to scramble along the best way they could. No unemployment, anything like that. And then, of course, I was around when Pearl Harbor happened and and World War II. And uh, I've uh, been very fortunate to be a a part of a a lot of things that have happened uh, in uh, history over the years. Now we've got computers and (laughs) cell phones and things that nobody ever dreamed of in, in my time. Let's uh, talk about kind of some of those those early days and those early players. I know Ty Cobb uh, was, was playing uh, before you were actually broadcasting, but you uh, obviously he lived on into, I believe, like 1960 or the early 1960s, and so you were able to strike up a, a relationship with him, you being a, a fellow Georgian. Talk to us about, about Ty Cobb. Uh, you know, he comes across as really as kind of surly individual that really had a lot of flaws to his character, and, and as somebody that knew him, what was Ty really like? Well, you're right about uh, he was considered uh, the meanest man in baseball. You know, did a lot of things that uh, uh, weren't uh, very human or very kind to people. But uh, he was very warm and and friendly with me. I interviewed him in 1940, my first year at WSB. They told me that uh, he was mean. He wouldn't even talk to a kid like me. I went down to his hometown in Royston, Georgia, and interviewed him. And uh, he filled up the 15-minute show very easily. And then... I'd see him again. I covered the Masters uh, uh, four, uh, three or four times, and he always came to the Masters. He le- 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 loved to sit around and talk to the golfers, and he was there, and I got to know him pretty well. And then I'd see him at old-timers days and when I might have to MC a luncheon or something, and we became uh, pretty good pals. But uh, he did have a reputation <laughs> that, 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 wasn't, that wasn't too good. I remember... We had a bat boy, an uh, ex-bat boy at Tiger Stadium, a fellow named Eddie Forster. At the time I got to know Eddie, he was probably 80 years old. And he, at one time, had been the bat boy, and he was also the delivery boy for the butcher. 
and he delivered some meat to Mrs. Cobb's house, and uh, the cops were at home, so he put it inside the screen door, Ooh. and it spoiled him before Ty and his oh. wife got home. <laughs> and uh, Ty didn't hesitate. He went down and beat hell out of the butcher. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, and, and the story that, that, that we saw, that the, there was a movie came on, I think Tommy Lee Jones played him, and, and you really, at the time of his death, really kind of looked like died kind of a, a lonely uh, a lonely old man. Is that, is that true, or was that Hollywood embellishing? Or well, you... I think that's true. I was in that movie for about 20 seconds you know, <laughs> as the MC of a banquet at Cooperstown. But Ron Shelton, I had known him before he played ball a little bit in the minor leagues, and he was the director. Same guy did Bull Durham and Tin Cup and White Men Can't Jump. And and uh, I think uh, it was pretty authentic from a baseball standpoint, but he did use a little poetic license. Uh, and the Cochran family didn't like the treatment that he gave Mickey Cochran. Mm-hmm. And uh, some of the uh, things about Cobb were exaggerated, I think, for the effect of the movie. And it was a tough movie to do because uh, the the hero was pretty much of a guy that you 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 couldn't root for, you know. <laughs> right, right. I had such a, a mean nature that it was it was hard to uh, empathize with him. And and the movie was not a uh, a material success. I think critically, it was pretty well. Regarded, Tommy Lee Jones did a good job, certainly, and Robert Wall, but it didn't make much money. He is the DH today. Swing, there's a drive to left. That one is long gone. Fielder weighs into that first pitch with his 29th home. We have a chat with the legendary Ernie Harwell, and in talking about Ty Cobb, I guess I wonder in this day and age of really too much media exposure of our baseball players and athletes is it often that someone's public persona belies the true person within i think so and uh, i think now we have a tendency to to get a more accurate picture of the people that the the baseball writers write about because everybody is so investigative bent now than in the days when i started back in 1948 with the brooklyn dodgers the the players and and uh, and the writers were more friendly with each other, and and the writers didn't uh, delve into the personal life of the uh, players, and they probably knew some things that weren't uh, too savory about different players, but they they never really wrote them. They concerned themselves mainly with uh, what was happening on the diamond, and they didn't uh, delve into the private lives of the players like the guys do today. Have you ever observed a player who may not have come into the majors with all the skills needed to be a superstar, but was someone for whom you really rooted to make it in the big leagues? Oh, yeah. I think that's the kind of a player that I sort of uh, uh, like to see, you know, fellows that that didn't have a whole lot of ability, but they had a great passion for the game, and they worked hard, and and they made the most of their ability. And on the other side of the coin, the most disappointing thing is to see some guy who's got tremendous ability but uh, doesn't make use of it and it may be lazy and and, and uh, doesn't bear down the way he should and, and he falls by the wayside. But uh, they're all kind of people in baseball. Baseball is sort of a microcosm of the outside. And if you w- went uh, outside, so to speak, and – pick 25 or 30 guys, you'd have pretty much the same thing you do Hmm. when you have a baseball roster. Any names quickly come to mind of someone who, just because they had a good heart, were tremendous people and had minimal skills that you really rooted for? Well, I think Tommy Brookins, in a way, he Hmm. was skillful. He wasn't, uh, you know, he wasn't a bad player at all, but uh, he had a great personality and uh, people really loved him and he, he wanted to play, had a great passion for the game. And there were, there are a lot of guys like that, you know. I could uh, probably, if I wanted to, I could probably name a whole <laughs> bunch of them. Steve Dillard comes to mind. He was uh, with the Tigers uh, for a while, and he was a sort of a utility infielder. And uh, there there are a lot of guys like that that, that I think people are attracted to, and they keep rooting for. And, of course, we get to enjoy Tommy Brookins here on the west side of the state as manager for the Whitecaps, and he's yeah, starting that, off that, a very great. nice career. Think, uh, he's, he's a great personality, and you know, people really love to be around Tommy. 
Certainly was. Let's get back to your days in Brooklyn a little bit because you touched on it, and it all goes with your being a, a part of history. And I know it, it's um, it's all so well covered in your your audio scrapbook here that, that we've been talking about uh, Jackie Robinson coming into the league to break the color barrier and how important that was. And just kind of give us a feel for for that time you were there, Ernie, and 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 all the things that really he had to go through. He really had to swallow hard in terms of uh, uh, you know he was an example, and he really he was a guy from what I understand had had a bit of a temper, had a lot of pride, and. Really really had to put up with a whole lot and really had to swallow hard for a while, didn't he? Uh, that's absolutely true. He did have a temper. And uh, when uh, he first uh, uh, came in and talked to Mr. Branch Rickey, who was the guy that uh, started the breaking of the color line and chose Robinson to do it, uh, Rickey told him, he said, uh, you know, you've got to turn the other cheek. And when all this abuse happens, all this uh, stuff they throw at you, uh, physically and verbally and so forth, you've got to turn the other cheek. And he said, well, Mr. Ricky, do you want somebody who doesn't have guts enough to fight back? And Ricky said, no, I want somebody with guts enough not to fight back. And if you fight back, this experiment is not going to be a success. So Jackie was able uh, to uh, hold off and, and restrain himself. And uh, Ricky gave him a couple of years. He said, by then, uh, you'll become a ball player, not just a black ball player. And that happened, and uh, I remember a game when he broke loose against the umpire Lee Ballantat. We were playing in Pittsburgh, and it was sort of a, <laughs> a signal moment for Jackie. Yeah. You know, he finally went over the edge, but by then he'd had a couple of years under the belt, and he it didn't make any uh, big difference. But he was a perfect guy to pick to break the color line, and I really look back on that, and I think it's the most significant event that's happened in sports because it opened the gate for the great African-American players, and not only in baseball but in all the other sports. Uh, plus, now we have uh, so many people from all over the world, China, you know, sure. uh, Taiwan, uh, Italy, everywhere playing uh, uh, professional sports in America. And it would not have happened if uh, Jackie Robinson hadn't broken the color line. Uh, Ernie, how how was Jackie accepted among his teammates? We we hear about you know the fans throwing tomatoes at him and, and calling him names and all that, but but you know obviously the other white guys on that Brooklyn Dodgers team did somebody take him under his wing a little bit there? Well, I think it was a little resent, resentment at at first, but uh, it was uh, pretty well hidden uh, by the players, and then eventually they they saw that Jack was a wonderful person had a great personality, was a natural leader, and, of course, had a great ability. So they came over to his side, even the ones that uh, weren't in his corner at the beginning. And at the beginning, too, some of the Dodgers uh, complained a little bit, and uh, Branch Rickey got rid of uh, most of the uh, discontented guys by trading them to other teams. So by the time I got there, I think uh, there was a lot of harmony uh, concerning uh, Jack and his teammates. Also, just want to touch on a little bit. I know one of your favorite players that we've heard about, uh, or if not your favorite, Willie Mays, and 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 certainly a, a legend in, in baseball lore. But uh, the the interesting story there, Ernie, is he really had a rough start, and uh, really could have the story of Willie Mays could have been very very short if he wasn't persistent and didn't have some people believing in him. Right. That's absolutely right. Uh, Leo DeRocha was. Uh, the manager and uh, Willie went in to talk to Leo. He'd gone one hit in 26 times at bat when they were at the polo grounds, and he went into the office there, and he was crying, and he said, Leo, you've got to send me back to the minors. I can't make it up here in the big leagues. And DeRocher said, as long as I've got New York across my uniform, you're going to be my center fielder. Just go out there and relax and play your game, and you're going to make it. And he certainly did, but uh, uh, a manager who might have been a little quicker on the draw, you know, with one for 26, sure. he might have uh, sent him back, and uh, you never know what uh, changes that might have made in his psyche and eventually in his uh, career. And, and, you know, you look at the, di the difference in times. As Willie Mays here, he becomes this legend in baseball. But, uh, you know, back then it wasn't uncommon after, a, or at least legend had it, uncommon after a Giants game for him to be in playing stickball in the, the streets of New York with some kids. Oh, yeah, he was just a young kid up from Alabama, and he'd uh, go back up to Harlem, and they'd, they'd play stickball. <laughs> <And> <laughs> he, he, he was a very uh, talented guy, but he also had a great spirit and a great verb, and he, he played with that. And I think people got the idea that it's so good to see this young guy play because not only is he talented, but he loves the game, and he plays it with such a passion. 
and we enjoy seeing him because he seems to be having such a good time. The Tigers have just finished their 2002 season, and I've just finished my baseball broadcasting career. And it's time to say goodbye, but I think uh, goodbyes are sad, and I'd much rather say hello. Hello to a new adventure. I'm not leaving, folks. I'll still be with you, living my life in Michigan, my home state, surrounded by family and friends. And rather than goodbye, please allow me to say thank you. Thank you for letting me be part of your family. Thank you for taking me with you to that cottage up north, to the beach, the picnic, your workplace, and your backyard. Thank you for sneaking your transistor under the pillow as you grew up loving the Tigers. Now, I might have been a small part of your life, but you've been a very large part of mine, and it's my privilege and honor to share with you the greatest game of all. Now, God has a new adventure for me, and I'm ready to move on. So I leave you with a deep sense of appreciation for your longtime loyalty and support. I thank you very much, and God bless We had talked people. a little bit earlier about all of the interesting decades in which you've broadcast the 1960s, certainly among the most turbulent but most interesting of all. Oh, the 60s were turbulent, that's right, and the Tigers uh, won the World Series in 68, which was uh, certainly a highlight in Detroit Tiger history. We had those terrible riots in Detroit in 67 that uh, uh, broke the town asunder, so to speak, and and uh, there was a lot of animosity among the races, and then in 68, the Tigers started to, to win, and people came together with a common cause to root for, and it didn't matter whether Willie Horton or, or uh, Al Kaline was the hero, or whether you're black or purple or green or mm. orange, everybody was rooting for the Tigers, and they had a common cause to root for, and the Tiger team was an excellent team with a lot of personality, and uh, they had a come-from-behind uh, syndrome connected with them, and that even showed up in the World Series. They got down three games to one mm-hmm. to the Cardinals and came back and finally won that seventh game in a great pitching duel between uh, Bob Gibson and Mickey Lolich. Northup hit a triple in the seventh inning, knocking in two runs, mm-hmm. and the Tigers went on to win their first title in a long time 1945 and, and i know that you know as you said the race riots of 67 the turmoil of 68 when they wind up winning it how important was it to have uh black athletes on that team the stature of a willie horton and earl wilson um gates brown people like that uh, to that team at that time i think that meant a lot i think it uh, brought the blacks into the situation where they could uh, root for the tigers along with the white folks and it meant a lot, and and the guys that you mentioned were all great representations too. They were uh, high class guys, and, and they were stars in their own right. Gates had an unusual year. He was the great pinch hitter at that time, and the Standard Club, which is a club in in Detroit, surprised Gates and and all of us by uh, giving him an automobile before a game, and mm-hmm. it just sort of came out of the blue, but it it, it signified uh, what the community thought of Gates Brown. And then, of course, Willie overshadowed Gates. He was a little more of a star. Everybody loved Willie. And Willie's still around, too. He's working for the Tigers, and that's good. And Al Kaline's also working for the Tigers now. So I like to see those uh, threads continue throughout the history and the tradition. Let's talk about number six. We're talking, of course, with Ernie Harwell, the legend uh, from Tiger uh, Tiger lore of uh, years gone by and still very much active in a lot of ways. Uh, my, favorite, my favorite player, without a doubt, Al Kaline. I know he's probably one of your favorites as well. Uh, just uh, just give us a, a few minutes on Al, what, what, what he was like, what he is like. Well, you're right. I think he's everybody's favorite who saw him play. I saw Al uh, two nights ago on his uh, birthday. He's 73 years old now. Oh. And uh, we were out uh, with some friends, and he and Louise were at the same place. And he looks good, and uh, he is my favorite Tiger because he could do everything well. He was a consummate uh, Detroit Tiger. Great outfielder. He had a tremendous arm, and he could catch everything hit his way. And he could hit for power, and he could hit for percentage. And uh, still remains the youngest batting champion of all time. And and that was quite an accomplishment, too, for a young guy coming along at the age of 19 and 20 and winning that uh, batting title. And 
he was a great leader to and a, a good part of the community. So I'm a great booster for Al Kaline. And he really played on a lot of really subpar Tiger teams for a lot of years. So when 68 and 67 came around, really had a root for him. And, of course, in 68, he had his arm broken by a, by a pitch, and he missed a significant part of the season. And Jim Northup was able to kind of come in and hit all those grand slams. And that, that posed Mayo Smith, the manager then, with a dilemma come World Series time, didn't it? Yeah, and uh, then uh, that's when uh, Mickey Stanley was uh, brought from center field to play shortstop, replacing all of that got uh, Northrop and, and Kalon both in the outfield at the same time. And Al had a great series, you know. He, right. As you said, he'd been hurt and, and uh, lost a lot of games. He didn't play in in 68, but he was ready in the World Series, and he had a key hit in the uh, fifth game, and then he ended up with a real good batting average and was one of the heroes of the series. I had a conversation one time with Mickey Stanley. I was fortunate enough to talk with him, and he said he always felt a little bit cheated in the 68 World Series. And I, I, kinda, I, I thought that that was kind of interesting that he'd say that, but he said, you know, everybody else was playing their position. I was moved in at shortstop, and he said, I was scared to death that I was going to do something that was going to cost us the game. Can, can you relate to that a little bit, Ernie? Oh, I think so, and he was such a great athlete that he adjusted to a short. He never, he never played shortstop at any time. Uh, high school any time, and he came in, and uh, luckily, I guess, uh, uh, one of the Cardinals hit a ground ball early, in, I think in the first inning of early in the game, and Mickey uh, was able to relax and, and play a great game, and uh, it gave a little bit more punch in the uh, Tiger lineup, because Euler, although he was a great fielder, he was one of the worst hitters in, <laughs> right. in the Major League history. Um, Danny McClain, you can't talk about the 68 Tigers without him, and boy, what a what a, a conundrum he is. On, on one hand, probably uh, one of the single greatest Tiger pitchers there ever was could really close out a game, could almost call the shots. Uh, he, he seemed to be in control of everything Ernie but himself, I guess, right? Well, I think that's a good way to put it. And uh, in the 68, he had that magnificent year, won 31 games, and the only guy that's done that uh, since uh, Dizzy Dean uh, did it back in the early 1930s. So when you figure that long, over 75 years or more, only one guy has done it. It's a pretty impressive uh, record. And, you know, you never say it'll never happen again, but uh, you're pretty much tempted to say that nobody's ever going to win 30 games the way the uh, pitching rotations are set up these days unless something changes changes drastically. I don't think it'll ever happen again. And, you know, what, what is his relationship now with the Tigers? I, we talked with Jim Price not too long ago, and he, he didn't come right out and say it, but you get a feeling that there's a definite estrangement between uh, Denny McLean and, and a lot of the rest of the, the Tigers from that, that, that time. Well, I think that's true. I think uh, they put up with Denny, you know, as much as they could, and, and finally it went over the edge, and a lot of the players that played for him uh, don't have anything to do with him anymore. I've always been very fond of Denny. I know he's he's got his shortcomings, and he's uh, served prison uh, terms twice and done a lot of bad things. But uh, I think uh, down deep, he's a good-hearted person. He's got a great uh, intelligence, and although uh, it didn't show and he did some things he shouldn't have done, but uh, I've always got along good with him. and. I, I've certainly admired his ability as as a pitcher. There's no question about that. One final question on the '68 team, then we'll take a quick break here. They they they're just a team that won so many games in their last at bat. And uh, Rick and I, as we said, we we're both young kids, uh, uh, really coming of age during that that time. As as an announcer and somebody being as close to the team as you were, obviously, was there always a feeling, even up in the broadcast booth, that hey, these guys are just not out of a game? I think everybody had that feeling. The team uh, itself had that, and the people that followed them and the fans always felt that uh, even though they got behind two or three or four runs, that uh, somehow somebody would come through. They seemed to have a different hero almost every game. Guys would come off the bench and hit a key home run or a triple, and somebody would make a great play in the field. And It was just uh, looked like they were destined to win, and they finally did. And then when they got in the World Series, they they were very disappointing in the early part of the series. They got down three games to one, and and uh, then they even were behind. And then the uh, in the fifth game, it looked like uh, the series was going to be over. And they rallied in that game, and then from then on, just kept on playing and finally beat the Cardinals. But uh, you're right; it was a colorful, interesting, come from behind team, and everybody really enjoyed them. Now, folks, I'm going to say my goodbye to Tiger Stadium, so I'm going to forget about the play-by-play for a moment. How do you talk to a legend? Can you say goodbye to a shrine? Can you walk away from a treasure? It's not easy. 
You do it with a lump in your throat and a tear in your eye. For almost 40 years, I've spent as much time at the corner of Michigan and Trumbull as I have at home. I've been elated, dejected, thrilled, and disappointed here. I've sweltered through the summer heat. I've frozen in the spring and fall. In sickness and in health, it's been my home, my office, and my refuge. When I first came here to broadcast, it was Briggs Stadium and then Tiger Stadium. And somewhere along the way, I began it to call it the corner of Michigan and Trouble, and soon shortened that to just the corner. To me, it will always be the corner, the most famous corner in Michigan. Tiger Stadium has been a dear friend, and even though I look forward to our new home, Comerica Park, and to the thrill of watching new Tiger stars, this old corner and its great players will remain a timeless gift of the past. The corner is part of our history, our heritage. It's been magic, hope, and the true heartbeat of our city. Baseball memories have come here to live and to be treasured. And you and I have been part of those memories. We've thrilled to the home runs, the strikeouts, the double plays. From generation to generation, we've joined that joyous crowd. And all of us love this old place. And it's closing tugs at our heart. And like you, like all of us, I will cherish it, memories. I know that there's never been a corner like Michigan and Trumbull. And, John, I know that uh, Ernie has certainly been blessed to work with a lot of folks who were also our favorites. One guy that we, John and I, both think are probably one of the most underrated guys ever in the broadcasting booth, Mr. Paul Carey, a true gentleman. Oh, absolutely. And uh, Paul and I were partners longer than uh, anybody else that uh, worked with me. And I think it was about 18 years. Mm. And, he was uh, so much of a professional and uh, was able to just uh, do a great job. And he had an extra burden for most of his years because the station uh, didn't want to use an engineer like every other major league uh, station did. And he had to do the engineering as well as the announcing. But he was a great friend, and we are still very close to each other. He's down in Florida right now, and his wife, that's here down in Pensacola, but we hear from him. And then when he comes back in the summertime, they'll come back around May. We have lunch together quite often. So he's been a great friend and a great partner. And the only problem with working with Paul, he made everybody who worked with him sound like a soprano. <laughs> he had a fantastic voice mm -hmm. and uh, had a great outlook and was a hard worker and just a terrific guy. Uh, another one of your partners, maybe one of your first with the Tigers, was, was George Kelly. Worked with you a little bit on radio. And then, you, of course, he went and worked for the Detroit Tiger, uh, the, the Fetzer Broadcasting Company, as far as the, the games that were on then. And for a lot of years, had a great uh, career on the TV side of things. Talk to us a little bit about uh, George Kell, Ernie, if you would. Well, uh, George and I were friends for years. I, I knew him uh, first as a player. And then when uh, he came to Baltimore, I got to know him even better. And uh, he retired after uh, Baltimore, went into uh, radio and TV. And then uh, when uh, Van Patrick uh, was let go with the Tigers, George called me and asked me if I'd come to Detroit and work. And they made a deal where I left Baltimore and came there and worked with him. And we worked in 60, 61, 62, and 63. And then uh, he went home in 64 to be with the family for a year. And then mm. in 65, the Tigers decided that... Uh, they would uh, divide uh, the radio and TV uh, uh, broadcast. They would put one team on radio and one team on TV rather than one team doing both. And uh, they asked George to come back, and he said, well, I can do it because of TV. They, they did just a few games the first couple of years. He did probably 20, 25 games, and he was able to spend uh, more time at his home in Swifton. So he accepted that job and then stayed on until the 90s, and did a great job and had a wonderful following here on TV. He worked with uh, different partners uh, most of those years, I think, uh, toward the end, especially with Al Kaline. Mm -hmm. They made a great uh, combination and had a lot of fans uh, who watched the, the TV. Any, uh, and I know this is an unfair question, but I'll ask it anyhow. Any uh, favorite manager that you had during your tenure with the Tigers that you, sp you spent, uh, you were really close to? I know you and Sparky had a special relationship. Well, Sparky and I were real, real close and uh, together more than uh, most. That uh, One of my favorites was Bob Sheffick. He didn't oh. last that long, but uh, he was a great guy, very unselfish and uh, quite modest and uh, a good baseball man. And uh, when he was fired, the Tigers put him in the booth with me. And in 1964, we had some great times together. And his wife, Mary, uh, were good friends of Lulu and ours. And 
we just had a good time together. And uh, but Bob died uh, fairly early in his life. He went to, to the Mets and became a general manager there. And then he died and uh, rather early, and we sure miss him. Mm-hmm. Let's talk. Uh, you couldn't as long as we got you here with your history of baseball. The, the current uh, steroid uh, scandal that's really ripping at baseball right now, and and something that I noticed here probably in the height of it, and I was too stupid to realize what it was all about. But they were talking about the ball being juiced and the the, the offensive uh, numbers going up. Little did we know, I guess, that the players were juiced. It wasn't the baseball. <laughs> but uh, talk to us about that. Your feelings on that, Ernie, and and those records. You know, and I, I go back to the 1961 season when Roger Maris hit 61. And that, that record seemed to be kind of like the holy grail. I mean, there was, you know, even the biggest guys, the Harmon Killebrews, the Frank Howards, they'd, they'd put together a 40 home run year, and, and those numbers seemed to mean something. And all of a sudden we got in this McGuire and Bonds era, and everybody's popping 60, 70 home runs, and it just became kind of a joke. Uh, your, your thoughts on, on this whole situation, Ernie? Well, I think this situation is a blot on baseball, certainly, but uh, I've always felt that the baseball is a great survivor. And uh, they've overcome even uh, larger problems than the steroid era, especially the uh, Black Sox scandal mm. in the 1919 World Series. They've overcome that, and they've had all kind of uh, problems, uh, strikes and cancellation of the World Series, the Pete Rose uh, situation, and other guys that have been into drugs and things like that. And I think eventually it'll blow over, and I don't think the average fan is uh, too concerned about it if uh, somebody comes up and uh, has a history of steroids and has a great year or two. I think uh, people forget that and uh, root for what he does on the field. And I think eventually we're going to have to look back and just say it was sort of fuzzy, at least it still is at this moment, mm-hmm. uh, who did it and who didn't and whether it was legal at the time and whether it wasn't legal. And, and all those uh, records are, are going to have to stand. I don't see how they can... Uh, experience uh, the records uh, because uh, uh, you never know when it happened or who was using Mm -hmm. them uh, uh, to any precise uh, amount and I think that's what's going to happen. As far as the game itself on the field are there any rule changes that you'd like to see in baseball to improve the game? I'd like to see the the amount uh, raised again back Mm -hmm. to 15 inches. I think uh, I think it was a a mistake to lower the amount. It gave the offense uh, too much of a Advantage and most all the rule changes uh, lately have uh, favored the offense, and I'd like to see the ballots brought back a little bit with uh, uh, more rules that might help the pitchers and uh, and make the strike zone a little bit uh, larger and uh, not worry about pitching inside as much as uh, the rule makers do or the umpires who enforce the rules uh, do. I'd, I'd like to get rid of the DH, I think. I've accepted it over the years, mm-hmm. but uh, it was bad to have uh, uh, the American League at such a disadvantage in the World Series with the DH. And I think um, I think we'd be better off if we had uniform rules in the two major leagues. And I know that you still uh, get on down to Comerica Park every uh, once in a while and, and root those uh, those Tigers on so they're still near and dear to your heart. And I couldn't let you get out of here with some thoughts on Tiger Stadium. I mean, I know uh, that as from one standpoint, if you didn't get the right seat, it was kind of a lousy place to watch a ball game. But boy, oh boy, what history went on there. And, and you could always move around to pole someplace and, and watch, a, watch a game. And I, I, I feel sorry every time I go by to go to Comerica Park and see that old shell of a, a stadium set in there and, and just kind of decaying. What, what were your thoughts on that, Ernie? Well, it was a great place to be and a great place to work. I think all the visiting announcers who came into Tiger Stadium loved to be so close. We used to say you could see them sweat and hear them cuss. We were so close. <laughs> mm-hmm. And uh, we're trying to work on a, a save the stadium idea. And it looks like uh, we're going to come up with an idea where they will save uh, a portion of the stadium, have about 3,000 seats in the lower deck from first to third, keep the dugouts, uh, keep the locker rooms, and, and the field will stay intact where high schools can uh, play on it and and other amateur teams. And I think that will be sort of a uh, memorial to those great days that we had there at the corner for so long. Well, that's fantastic, and that's uh, I know Rick and I are thrilled to, to hear something being done with that. Baseball is a president tossing out the first ball of the season and a scrubby schoolboy playing catch with his dad on the Mississippi farm. A tall, thin old man waving a scorecard from the corner of his dugout. That's baseball. And so is a big, fat guy with a bulbous nose running home one of his 714 home runs. 
There's a man in Mobile who remembers that Hannes Wagner hit a triple in Pittsburgh 46 years ago. That's baseball. And so is a scout reporting that a 16-year-old pitcher in Cheyenne is the coming Walter Johnson. Baseball is a spirited race of man against man, reflex against reflex, a game of inches. Every skill is measured. Every heroic, every failing is seen and cheered or booed and then becomes a statistic. In baseball, democracy is trying to clear it. The only race that matters is the race of the bag. The creed is a rule book, and color merely something to distinguish one team's uniform from another. Baseball is a rookie, his experience no bigger than the lump in his throat as he begins fulfillment of his dream. And it's a veteran, too, a tired old man of 35 hoping that those aching muscles can pull him through another sweltering August and September. Nicknames of baseball, names like Zeke and Pie and Kai Kai and Home Run and Cracker and Dizzy and Dazzy. Baseball is the clear, cool eyes of Rogers Hornsby, the flashing spikes of a Ty Cobb, and an overaged pixie named Rabbit Moranville. Baseball, just a game, as simple as a ball in batting, yet as complex as the American spirit it symbolizes. A sport, a business, sometimes almost even religion. While the fairy tale of Willie Mays making a brilliant World Series catch and then dashing off to play stickball in the streets with his teenage pals. That's baseball. So is the husky voice of a doomed Blue Gehrig saying, I consider myself the luckiest man on the face of this earth. Baseball is cigar smoke, hot roasted peanuts, the sporting news, ladies day, down in front. Take me out to the ball game in the Star Spangled Banner. And baseball is a tongue-tied kid from Georgia growing up to be an announcer and praising the Lord for showing him the way to Cooperstown. This is a game for America. Still a game for America, this baseball. Thank you. Talking with our old friend, and Ernie, I think that has to be one of the highlights of your career is that everyone who knows you feels like they do know you. They feel like you're an old friend, even if they've never met you before, and you're like everyone's favorite uncle. Well, thank you. I think that's because of the role I had, you know, as the announcer for the Tigers. I've always felt if somebody comes into a region and works four or five years, whether he's good or bad, people have to listen to him, and they get used to him, and they can't get rid of him. So you have to take me whether you want me or not. That's kind of our claim to fame, too, Ernie. We're hoping for exactly the same kind of success. And of course, hanging around, yeah, right. We're talking about Ernie Harwell's audio scrapbook, a unique look at the national pastime in a four-hour CD. You can get more information at eharwell.com, and we'll talk about a lot more information about that in a little while. But a friend of ours, Ernie, is a friend of the radio station and a big Tigers fan. His name is Tim Burgess, and he also met you last summer, and he had mentioned that he had suggested that you author a new book about the Baseball Chapel. That gives us a chance to talk about Baseball Chapel a bit, but I was also wondering if you've received any other suggestions for new book ideas that seem intriguing to you. Well, they're all kind of ideas, and they are intriguing, but I haven't gotten around to them. You know, I'm a little <laughs> bit lazy, but I appreciated that from Tim, and a baseball chapel is dear to my heart because I was in sort of in the beginning of it. It started around the early 1960s, and it started just sort of by accident. The Cubs and the Minnesota Twins were the originators of it, and and uh, they would ask a, a preacher to come in and, and, and talk to the, the players on Sunday morning, and, and they'd have a few people there. And then uh, later on, I suggested that uh, after the Tigers got into it that we – I do it at the ballpark rather than at the hotel because it was such a hectic time on a Sunday. You know, the players had to get up early. They usually don't get up until 1 or 2 o'clock and had to get up and check out and, and get breakfast and uh, pay their bills and get on the bus and so forth and get packed for the next city. And uh, when we got to the ballpark uh, and put it out there, the players were in their own element, a lot more relaxed. They didn't have to dress up. A guy could come in. You could have the chapel Sometimes we have them in the shower or back in the corner where they wouldn't bother anybody. And it it became a quite a viable thing. And eventually, Waddy Sposter got some uh, funding from the baseball commission of Bowie Coon, and he got to have a, more of an official stamp. And the managers who objected to it came around, and it uh, gravitated into quite a thing. And now they have a chapel in 
auto racing and basketball and hockey and pro football and college football and almost any sport you can name. And it's just a wonderful thing to see young men uh, give their lives to Jesus and change their whole lives and and turn around uh, sometimes the things that they shouldn't have been doing are dropped and the, and the, they get the right attitude about life and and uh, really have a relationship with Jesus Christ. A lot of people also don't realize that you're a very successful songwriter and that you've collaborated or had songs sung by artists like B.J. Thomas, Marilee Rush, and Mitch Ryder. Tell us about that, and if you have any new projects in which you're working in the songwriting. Well, I haven't done much songwriting lately. You know, when the rappers came in, I I couldn't compete with them, but uh, I had a great time uh, writing songs, and I did uh, have a little luck with some of them. But uh, I tell people I've had, uh, as a songwriter, had more no-hitters than Nolan Ryan. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Ernie, your broadcasting style, of course, it was, it was down homes, it was folks, we all felt comfortable with you. Um, in this day and age, sometimes you get the, the Homer announcer. Now, there was no doubt in my mind that you were a, a Tiger fan, but really, you couldn't really tell when we listened to you. I mean, you, you played it pretty much straight down the middle. And uh, talk to us about your style and, and maybe what you visualized as you were calling all those great historic games of uh, your gone by well my style was down the middle i felt like i was uh, first a reporter and uh, then an entertainer and that that the rooting belonged to the people that were listening uh, they could root for the tigers if they wanted to most of them probably did and i was uh, more or less neutral in the favor of the tigers and i didn't believe in saying come on gang or we've got this or we've done that and so forth and try to give the other team as much credit as i could because uh, they were out there playing, too, and doing their best. But uh, I think everybody, when he goes into radio, has to be uh, whatever he is. And I think it's a, a burden to be somebody else. It's harder to be something you're not, and it's not as natural. And I think it's a lot more successful if you realize that uh, you're just going to be who you are, and you're going to make mistakes, and don't worry too much about it. And some people are going to like you, and some aren't, and uh, that's a way of life. And I think every style is okay. You know, I don't object to a guy being a so-called homer if he wants to, as long he, as he describes the game and tells us what the score is and, and who's winning and what's happening on the field. I think that's the criteria that we have to use as listeners. And I always had the feeling that most everybody who does a big league baseball uh, he's doing a good job because otherwise he probably wouldn't be around. Uh, talk to us a little bit, too. Something that always fascinated me was you would work the first three innings and you'd come back for the last three innings regardless of the, the partner that you had. And, and then you'd kind of go away every once in a while. We wouldn't hear from Ernie in those middle innings. Did you actually stay in the booth? Did you did you wander around a little bit, get a different perspective on the game? Well, what? well it varied from time to time. Most of the time I wandered around. I'd sit in the press box for a little bit and uh, maybe have a Coke or something and and then, then I'd go back when the time came. Sometimes I'd stay in the booth for a while. It just depends. Of course, my obligation was to keep up my scorecard because <laughs> when I got back, I still right. had to know what happened in those middle three innings. Sure. <laughs> and uh, that was something I was obliged to do. But as long as I did that, it didn't much, uh, make much difference uh, where I was. But it, it was something that I, f- I feel like a uh, broadcast should have two voices of uh, play-by-play. I think... Uh, I think the so-called chief announcer needs a little bit of rest. I think the folks listening need a little bit of a rest from the voice, too. And I always like the idea that, say, for instance, Paul Carey could come in and people could enjoy his work for three innings and then uh, get back to listening to me. And uh, that's the way I like to see it done. Some people don't do it that way, but mm-hmm. whatever they want to do is okay. And Ernie, as we wrap up here, what what does uh, Ernie Harwell do now except uh, talk to a couple of schmoes every once in a while from a local radio station for, <laughs> for a few hours? What, what is well, your, what's your life like? I'm for Blue Cross Blue okay. Shield. I do that uh, year-round, and in the summertime I write a column. But uh, my next uh, year will be my 16th year with a free press doing mm-hmm. a column every week. And I also do some uh, vignettes for Fox Detroit. I do about uh, 25 or 6 of those, and then... I go out on the banquet circuit, make a speech once in a while. If I can't find a fan dancer, they let me come in and try to entertain them. (laughs) Well, Ernie, we certainly feel blessed. You have been number one on our wish list for a long time. Not sure what else might be in store for John and Rick for the rest of 2008, but we know that you've already blessed our year, and we can't thank you enough. Well, thank you. I enjoyed being with you guys. It was a lot of fun, and 
Just keep up the good work. Thank you very much, Ernie. Thank you. All right. Hopefully we'll have a chance to check in with you as the, the months proceed. Hopefully you'll enjoy yourself at spring training. All right. Please do. And those questions were great. I enjoyed it so much. Oh, thank you, Ernie. There's a breaking ball in for a strike, and he stood there like the house by the side of the road and watched it go by. Struck him off. 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 Struck him off.